All right, we're going to turn tonight for just a few minutes. Uh, I actually changed, uh, was had kind of a direction I was going to go as it pertained to our speech and those kinds of, and, and overflow of the heart. I even shared that this morning, but uh, actually decided to go in a different direction tonight. But we're going to be in Romans 15. We're going to look at Romans 15, 1 uh, for just a few minutes, uh, just because um, through this morning and, and even just uh, as I was preaching this morning and thinking through one of these things kind of came to me as we were and have been thinking and praying through discipleship and the call for us to instruct one another. As I said, one of the pieces of application as I was walking through the sermon this morning was the idea of living in community and the wisdom that we glean from being part of a church. And one of the things that we have as a blessing of being a part of the church is that there are other brothers and sisters in Christ who know more than we do, who are more mature than we are, that can pour into us, and that's how we gain wisdom, especially as we think about, again, the, this idea from this morning of being on the path of wisdom or the path of folly. Now, you might hear those words, again, instruct, give wisdom, um, and you might wonder, you might think, well, that's not something I'm necessarily called to do. And no, we're not all called to preach. We're not even all called to teach publicly in some way, whether that's in a school, in a, like a class or something else. But just because you don't preach and just because you don't teach maybe in a classroom setting doesn't mean that you don't make disciples. It doesn't mean that you don't instruct and it doesn't mean that you don't have wisdom to give. And that's, I think, what Paul is beginning to speak of when he begins to uh, I think I told you 15.1. It's actually going to be 15.14. Um, what, he, what, what Paul begins to speak of as he closes his letter or begins to close his letter uh, to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 15, what Paul is beginning to talk about is this missional kind of desire that he has for the church at Rome. Now, we know that he does not make it to Spain, but his plans were that he would go on from Rome on to Spain. And what he's beginning to share with them in Romans 15 was this idea or his desire for them to be kind of a base of operations and to support him as he would go on from there to plant other churches. And so he began to kind of talk through what some health, what healthy churches would look like in some ways. Um, and, and he's, again, continuing this through line, if you read the whole book, about justif justification through faith and the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. And he continues to unpack that, again, all the while, talking about these are the things that are going to make you a healthy church. These are the things that are going to help you grow as individuals and as a church. And so he encourages them with those things. And I think that's what we see in verse 14. So we're just going to look at one verse tonight, Romans, 4, Romans 15, verse 14, as it says this, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. So I think when we see this verse, and we pair that, or if we think about being intimidated about teaching, or we feel intimidated about making disciples, or we feel intimidated about sharing wisdom, I think this is one of the places we can go to look for us to, be to one, receive comfort, but then also to receive encouragement that there are many things that we already have in order to make disciples. There are things that we already have that God will then use to allow us to instruct, and maybe in ways that we don't necessarily think about. So there's three things there that Paul says. One of the first things he tells them or that he commends them for is that they possess goodness. So I think this is something possessing goodness that is important for us if we're to instruct, if we're to make disciples, we must possess goodness. Look back again at the beginning of verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Now, some scholars think that Paul is actually just kind of trying to butter them up, that he's trying to flatter them. He's trying to basically kind of give false praise so that they will support his ministry. I don't think that that's what we're seeing here. I think it's actually that with the praise that Paul gives is genuine. I believe that he's sincere in what he sees taking place in this church. And what Paul says, when he says that he is satisfied, the word actually means persuaded. It means that he is convinced. So what he's saying is, I am persuaded or I am convinced that you possess goodness. Now, what does he mean when he says goodness? Okay, sometimes good might mean good enough or it might mean just better. It might be on a sliding scale. When he says goodness, the phrase means or the word means morally upright. It means morally good. Okay, so it means that they are in good standing. 
And when he says that they were filled with it, that doesn't just mean like, you know, that means it could be to the brim and maybe even spilling over. So this picture I kind of had in my mind as I was reading this is that these people in the church at Rome, they're so full of goodness that they're kind of wallowing around. And when they bump into something, some goodness kind of spills out. Okay, so this is kind of the picture that Paul is painting here of the people that he or to the church there at Rome. Now, what does he mean then when, as I said, when it means goodness? Well, I think that could mean for us a couple of things as it pertains to discipleship. Now, if we're going to make disciples, if we're going to make disciples of Christ, then we have to be saved. There has to be salvation that has to have been taken place. And we know from a couple of weeks ago from what Paul actually preaches or or teaches rather wrote here earlier in Romans is that we are justified by God. We are made good and otherwise we receive the righteousness of God through Christ. So we are made positionally, morally upright at the moment of salvation. Okay, so I think that's one way, one of the things that is obviously going to be required if we're to make disciples. We need to be righteous and we need to be disciples ourselves. But I think he's also pointing to, or could be pointing to, the idea that if we're going to make disciples, then we need to have some level of maturity. That there has to be some level of Christian maturity that we need if we're going to teach others or if we're going to give wisdom to others. So if we are to disciple people, we need to be mature. Now, that does not mean that we don't sin. All of us are going to always sin. That's going to be a battle that we'll have, as I've said many times, and as we say here, from now until we pass into the life to come. But as people who are maturing, and as people who should be growing in Christ, that that means that our battles with sin should be different than they were years ago. That our battles with sin should be shorter. And maybe that there should be greater distances between those battles with sin. So disciple makers then have to consistently do what we're told in Proverbs eleven twenty seven 27. That it says that those who are diligently seek good find favor. So we who are seeking to make disciples have been made good. We are to diligently seek out good because the turn is, the the antithesis of that, as it says in the same verse, is that if you seek out evil, you will find it. And so those who are seeking to make disciples cannot be seeking evil. We should be seeking good, having been made good by Christ. So to make disciples, we must be saved. And we also must be disciples ourselves and have some level of maturity. So the encouraging thing is that most of what we've seen right here has nothing to do with us. Being made good had nothing to do with us and had everything to do with God. Being matured in Christ happens through the work of the Holy Spirit, which while is a work of God and God receives the credit, does require some effort for us. We do put forth effort in sanctification. But that does not mean that we wait to attain some high level of maturity before we begin making disciples. Yes, there is a we, de- we do need to mature. Someone who's just become saved yesterday probably needs a little bit more time before making disciples. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't begin to share their faith. But it does help for us, and we should, as we are making disciples, should be, we, there needs to be a level of maturity. But if we wait to become some type of idea of super Christian or heightened level of maturity, then we will never begin to make disciples. If we wait until we know everything, then we will never make disciples. Or if we wait until every battle and every sin that we have or every temptation that we fight goes away, then we will never make disciples. But the beginning work that is needed for a disciple maker or one who has wisdom, again, remember, be encouraged that it is done in you by God, and he is the one who makes as he is the one who makes us good and the one who grows us in righteousness in maturity. So we are good. We possess goodness. We are filled with goodness. The next thing is in order to make disciples is we must be filled with knowledge. If you look back there at verse 14, he says that I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. So if we are to make disciples, then that means that we must possess knowledge. There are certain things that we need to know. If we're going to teach, then yes, this stands to reason that you need to know what it is that you're going to teach. But why is it that we need knowledge? Of course, you need material to teach, but knowledge is also needed for discernment. If we're going to instruct others on the ways of God, then we must be equipped equipped to help them discern between good and bad doctrine. 
There is a lot of incorrect and just bad theology in our world, and we need to be able to spot them, especially in our age of, again, we mentioned this morning, the heightened age of how hyper-connected we are with communication and half the stuff that gets put on online. And I kind of want to be sensitive here, but there's a lot of bad theology going on right now about the, the eclipse that's going to take place tomorrow. Which, by the way, that doesn't mean Jesus is going to come back tomorrow. He still could, but it's not going to have anything to do. Actually, it's probably not because everybody's saying he's going to come back tomorrow because of the eclipse. So that pretty much guarantees he's not coming back tomorrow. But we need to be able to spot those things, and knowledge is what helps us do that. We need to spot when someone's teaching prosperity theology. That is rampant. Paul warned us in Ephesians 4 not to get swept away by every wind of doctrine. So where does this begin? How do we gain knowledge? Where do we go to gain knowledge? What comes from studying and knowing the Bible? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So when we disciple and when we teach, we do all of the things that Paul just told Timothy. We teach, we reproof, we correct, we train in righteousness. There's no secret to the Christian faith. It's not as though we try to reach some heightened level of enlightenment when it comes to it. The the Bible reveals everything we need to know about the Christian faith. Now, we need help sometimes interpreting it. We need help understanding it. But we have what we need to know has been given to us. But having said that, I'll repeat what I said a little while ago. You do not have, have to have all of the answers about God or about the Bible to begin to share wisdom or to begin to disciple others. But you need to be comfortable being able to go back to the Bible and see where the answers to questions you don't know might be found. You don't need a certain number of equipped classes, although those as helpful as they are, the reasons we're doing those is so that we can, one, become better disciples, but then two, so that we can then disciple others. We're trying to accomplish Ephesians 4. That's part of what we're doing by building up the saints for the work of ministry. That's part of what equip is to do. But you don't need something like that to begin. You have to wait until you finish some type of track before you can begin to make disciples. That helps, of course, but it's not the requirement. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he didn't say complete 16 hours at seminary before you go to make disciples. So we need, we are full of goodness, we need to have knowledge, and we also must be able to instruct. So it says again, returning to verse 14, I, am my, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. So the word for instruct there means to admonish or to warn. It's what Paul means when he says to instruct to each other. So as we are sharing wisdom, as we're discipling, as we are are, uh, teaching each other, we are instructing each other, warning each other about things. That's why being upright matters. Because if we are upright morally, then that means that we instruct with the right motive. The right motive is to see others follow Christ, to see others be more like Jesus. Our motives cannot be that we get to tell everyone why they're wrong and why we're right, to kind of puff up our ego. Paul warns against that specific thing. Being upright and being moral maintains our credibility to teach and to instruct. And it's why we need knowledge, because without knowledge, we won't have anything to teach with. Now, when we hear instruct, then it may bring to our mind what I'm doing right now, or it might bring to our mind standing in front of a group of people in a classroom. It's natural to hear that because when we think of our teachers, sometimes they're called instructors. That's the way our education system was designed. But friends, that is not the only place that teaching or warning or instructing or admonishing is going to take place. It will always take place in environments like this. I would go on to say more instruction and more giving on of wisdom is going to happen in places that are more informal than formal. It doesn't have to just take place in a a classroom. It can take place in a coffee shop. It can take place in your home. It can be one-on-one or in larger groups depending on the circumstances. So don't assume that in order to instruct or teach or admonish that you have to be comfortable in being front of a crowd. It doesn't have to be. You may make many disciples in your life and never have to be in front of a large group teaching or speaking publicly. But 
you may be able to take the Bible and divide it correctly and apply it to someone's life and help them grow as a disciple or to instruct a brother and sister when they have a question. So if I want to instruct others or if I want to make disciples, what should I do? If I have a desire, and you should have a desire because it is a command for all of us to instruct, it is a command for us to make disciples, what should we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is to pray for God to send someone to us to disciple. Now, most of the time, our first mission field, I've mentioned this before, is going to be members of our family. We need to be discipling members of our family. But there may also be other people that God is calling you to disciple, or there may be that there is this passion or this growth and understanding when you realize, hey, there are other brothers and sisters, or there are other brothers or sisters, if you're women, that I need to be discipling. So pray that God would send someone to you for you to disciple, to instruct. And then look for those who are in your path that you connect with and desire to disciple. Primarily, that should be within our church. When, and, and I'll speak to that in a moment. But again, that's where we look for. Who are the people that God has placed me in church with that I can begin to disciple? Not always, but that's where we should, that's one of the places we should be looking. And as you prepare, we need to practice Colossians 3.16 by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Study the Bible alone and study it with other people. Meditate on it so that you grow in your knowledge and grow in your understanding of what it says. And then also do other things to prepare. Learn theology. If there's areas that you're not comfortable with that you want to know more about, learn it. That's why we do classes and things here. Or you can seek out one of the elders or a growth group leader or someone that you trust if you've got questions about something. And then also one of the things that you need to do is be willing to end discipleship. Part of being a disciple or discipling is so that that person would then go on to disciple others. So that might mean we're going to spend a year together. And then after that, or maybe we're going to meet once a week for an entire year. And then maybe the next year you're going to meet once a month. Or maybe quit meeting uh, or maybe even less, uh, less periodically. So that they can then go on to meet others and to disciple others. Or maybe you already have three or four discipling relationships and you don't have the time to take on someone else. So rather than do a kind of a mediocre job at it, be willing to say, hey, I don't have the time right now, but here's someone else who might, that I think you might be paired with. So what do I do if I want to be discipled? Well, just like the others before, pray for God to send someone to disciple you. Be part of a local church. And as you are in the local church, see who God is placing in your path whether it's in a growth group or whether it's in a Bible study or wherever it is that God is placing you, that you see, hey, this person, there's some maturity about this person. Take them out to lunch. Take them to coffee and say, hey, there's something about you in your life that I'm noticing, and I want to know if you'd be willing to disciple me. But then also be ready that they may tell you no. And if so, that may sting. But then say, okay, if that's not it, then there's going to be someone else. God commands us to make disciples and to be discipled. So if God commands that and wants that for us, he will provide it. And then again, just as with someone who's going to be a discipler, practice Colossians 3.16 by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Reading the Bible, reading with others, being a part of the community. So we have been given wisdom in Christ for our salvation, but we have also been given wisdom that we are to use to teach others to make disciples. So let's be urgent with this task here at Seven Oaks. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the privilege it is, Lord God, uh, to make disciples. You, Lord, have chosen us to do this. You've commanded us to do this, Lord God. And Lord, this is your plan. And Lord, we pray that you would burden us to make disciples. Uh, We pray, God, that you would show us the people that we need to move toward. Uh, we pray for those in our church that desire discipleship, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, that you'd provide that. You'd provide that from the members here. We pray, Lord, that we would train others in how to do it, Lord. We know, God, that you've given us your word, and Lord, you have given us what it needs. But Lord, help us to use the word to prepare others to make disciples. Lord, again, we just ask that you would bless us tonight, Lord God, as we leave here in a few moments. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.